Um, before we get to our next keynote, uh, there were a couple things I have to do. So the first thing I want to do is we have a number of uh, board members of the society, as well as people who have worked on this conference here, uh, as well as people who are running various committees that keep the organization going. So if you are in any of those groups, if you're a leader, a volunteer leader in this organization, please stand up and be recognized. Anyhow, this, this group really runs on the effort of uh, all these volunteers, so thank you for that. And this conference, as I mentioned earlier, could not take place without the uh, support of our sponsors. Um, so I want to go through, and uh, some of our sponsors are going to give us a few words and introduce themselves uh, to you and, uh, and to tell you what they do and why they're here. So we're going to start with Patients Like Me. Who's here from Patients Like Me? I think Ashley, is that right? Oh, there she is. Okay, come on up there. Are you going to give us a few words? No, no, I couldn't. But I will say, well, I'll speak on behalf of 
you. The American College of Radiology has been a strong, stalwart uh, partner of ours for a number of years now, and uh, they're very interested in this area of how do we engage patients in their health care, particularly on, obviously, radiologic issues. Uh, so more to come on that exciting, you cut me off? Oh, there you go. On that exciting relationship. <laughs> All right, so give, put your hands together for a very positive uh, And next we have Kairos. Kairos. There we go. Oh, we got a twofer. We still only have three minutes. It's not three minutes of <laughs> You saved some time so, so we can spend it. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I have, uh, Kairos was founded 10 years, so we have the same anniversary uh, in Germany, and, and now we are spreading out. I have my uh, COO for, for the US office here. But just a little anecdote. What is Kairos doing? First, are you familiar with the name, Kairos? You know, you, know, you know what I mean? It's exactly the opposite of Kronos. So now you have a hint. Um, what we are doing, we are doing software, so we are talking about all the time there about that, but little bits about my history, because uh, I'm a lawyer, unfortunately, but I really like it. <laughs> and uh, so that was a reason to, to start with this company, and I worked for one of the biggest <laughs> European university hospitals, it's the Charité in Berlin, and we figured out we have a problem, because we have our uh, Software vendors, they're acting like the CIA. They're really like, like the typical electronic patient record uh, vendors or the hospital information system uh, uh, vendors. They were really, really weird. They, they're saying, okay, Martin, we understand. We take it from here. Thank you for your cooperation. I was thinking, no, 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 no. I want to have the data. I want to run a search. I said, no, no, you can't do that. So, so it was really weird. So, so we started with a new company to say, okay, we need FAIR. FAIR means findable accessible, uh, uh, interoperable, and reusable data. That is exactly what we like to generate, and that is exactly what we need right now. And is that is not in the, what, what can I say, the philosophy of all those other vendors uh, when, they, when it comes to typical healthcare. But just to focus on the product, I pass the word to my colleague. Yeah, so as Martin said, I came on this year to help Kairos in the US. I saw a product that was really inspiring, being a kid who grew up without Facebook and then watched my country get absorbed by Facebook. It was really refreshing to see someone who wanted to empower people with data, not hold it hostage. And so being able to be a part of an event like this is really what we're all about, trying to insert patients back into the data life cycle at a hospital, at a research clinic, at a biobank, at an, any other type of medical institution, making sure you're an active, informed, and transparent participant as healthcare changes. It goes from the clinic visits to a clinical trial back to a hospital that you're always empowered with the information that the other companies and the other actors are, have been so for years to come. It's now the time to use that data for the patient. One last comment, because we have a great law in Europe or in the EU. It's a so-called GDPR. Are you familiar with GDPR? We really love that. Everybody's talking about that in a totally wrong position. They're talking about data security. I really like that for sure, that's absolutely necessary, but most people don't understand what's behind that. Because that is a great law for patients, right now, or for everybody. You get your data in a structured way. That is outstanding. You have really the right to ask everybody, oh, you are saving data about me, you are storing data about me, give them to me in a structured way. Not what Facebook did in, in a lot of files, uh, paper, paper wise. It was one part, and the la la last point is, because somehow I really like the Americans, because you are open for everything. It is a little bit like, like, like the Wild West, and, and sometimes the Wild West needs a sheriff. So, <laughs> It's not me, it's not me, sorry. That's you, that's the patient. The patient is a sheriff. The patient is a quarterback of the system. And we really like that. Thank you very much for that. Now I'm afraid we're going to have to go out of dodge. All right, well, thank you. This is the first year that Kairos is joining us, and so we truly welcome uh, their partnership. Uh, and next, we're going to bring up Salem Oaks. Kevin? Thank you, Danny. So the first thing I'm going to do is answer your question about why do I have his name Salem Oaks? <laughs> so could everybody stand up? The word Salem means peace. So I want you to take a deep breath. Let it out. 
few of these. Oaks. I have a 600 year old oak tree in my backyard. It's strong. And I want to have you do something that I learned from a patient leader. His name is David Feigenbaum. Some of you may have read his book. He's got Castleman's disease. And he does this thing called, oh, what was it called? Castleman's crush or something. But I want you all to go like this. <laughs> Let's do it on three so we can see it. Castleman's Crusader, that's what it was. He's got like a superhero that he's got some artist do for his, his rare disease. Okay, so here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> so Salem Oaks is about peace and strength for patients. And the way we're doing that, the way we're getting started is I'm sharing my knowledge of the pharmaceutical R&D industry and how decisions are made and where the money comes from and who you can influence there so that patients and caregivers and family members can actually influence that process. And we're doing that through educational means. We have some online courses. I've got some more expensive courses that are much more college level, kind of a virtual team type course. And I just started a podcast called Improbable Developments. It's available on all your favorite uh, podcast uh, things. And if you could listen to that, that would be great. And if you want to talk to me and learn more about what we're doing, I would really enjoy it. Okay, and I think those are the, uh, the, I think I got all the top, topest tier sponsors. Uh, well, no, actually, you know what, I think we actually probably uh, owe Inspire and WeGo. I think we told them they were going to say something. John, you want to speak about uh, Inspire? sitting here today and thinking that several years ago uh, I was at the uh, Health IT conference hymns out in Vegas and uh, watching a young entrepreneur talk about her fledgling company and her fledgling product and in the course of telling it she relayed that um, as a young adult studying medicine um, she felt um, tremendously ill, uh, incapacitated, um, multiple specialists and no answers and uh, she said that that she did find an answer, had an operation, um, and it was able to um, develop a, an entrepreneurial business and to develop a software solution. And it was fueled by her recovery. And I walked up to her after her presentation and handed her a business card and thanked her for her story. And she looked at the business card. She said, oh, Inspire, that's where I found the answer to the operation that saved my life. And she said, you saved my life. Just I'm like to hear, and I acknowledged it, the power of that, and I said, your community is it, but she had the ability to go into a healthcare social network, find information, get it back to her in a manner that she could do something with it, and um, that's powerful, and we honor that, and uh, she's one of now nearly two million members on Inspire.com interacting about 220 communities on Inspire.com. And uh, here today among us, I'm proud to say as a, as a, a company supporting this wonderful organization and this event is uh, a dozen or so members of Inspire. Um, and I'm glad you're here and I hope you get lots out of it and bring it back to your community or your, your organization or your blog or your Twitter chat or wherever it is uh, and use it um, to empower and inform others. And uh, that's what we're about. And uh, we love being part of this organization and, and uh, try to lift the manifesto and um, look forward to next year. Great, thank you. That was Inspire, and uh, since, since John's a marketing guy, I knew he could handle the spur of the moment stuff. Do we have someone here from WeGo Health? And then I think we, we end this, because uh, I think we, we, our WeGo people had to leave. So we're gonna skip them, but WeGo has been a partner for many years as well, and uh, WeGo is an awesome organization. You'll uh, learn more about them. All right, so now uh, I have one quick announcement, and that is that just to remind you, we are doing videos. Actually, our friends at, uh, at Patients Like Me are doing videos, asking people questions. If you go, so at some point, coffee break, whenever, go out here to the right, Towards the exit, you'll see a sign that says uh, uh, where they're doing videos. It's a co-branded sign. All right, speaking of patients like me, um, 
So uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, someone who I've known for many, many years, and we always uh, uh, have interesting discussions, that's all I can say. We don't always agree, but that's okay too, and uh, he's really an interesting uh, character. And, and, and <laughs> yes, character, I chose that word advisedly. Um, so Jamie Haywood, I know that your program says we're gonna talk about participatory science. Okay, well, sort of get to that, but Jamie, in his typical Jamie Heywood fashion, came in just early in the lunch break, right before he's going on here, and he says, Danny, come here, can we do this a little differently? <laughs> so literally, we're doing this differently. So this is gonna be uh, not a typical keynote, but Jamie's hopefully gonna be doing most of the talking. We will argue a little bit. But Jamie is the founder, co-founder, and CEO of a company called Patients Like Me. And there are a lot of representatives of patients like me, both pa their patients and people who work for them. Very interesting company that you're going to learn more about. Um, and I'm not going to say anything else. You can read about Jamie, plenty of things written about him. So let's have a hand for Jamie here. Thank you. So why don't we uh, sit in the middle here? In the middle of Conversation uh, in, a, in a participatory fashion, and, and part of it is, Danny and I have a dinner pretty regularly, and we argue a lot. And I thought it would be um, helpful to uh, to maybe argue together. Um, and, and I think the other part, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've been doing a lot of reflection the last year, and I thought it was worth just reflecting a little bit because because uh, um, what I've learned after twenty years is. Um, uh, it, it is harder to make the answers that I believe. What I, actually, I'll wait for you to say, how is being right working for you? Is a <laughs> phrase my therapist asks me on a regular basis. Um, and, and I'm actually asking that question a lot. How is being right working for me? And, and I think that that's a question we should all be talking about. So, so let's start out, Jamie, by, uh, why don't you, not, not everybody here knows your story and the story of patients like me which is really a fascinating story. And so I want to start with that and why you did what you did and how you did it and, and what happened there. Um, so, you know, I, I think my, uh, talk, I'm a mechanical engineer um, uh, and I'm like, a, like one of those real mechanical engineers that build robots and big machines and, um, uh, and, I, and I actually love that. I love to build things. Um, uh, my, my wife is not very happy about being in the house at the moment because my house is in pieces and I somehow felt I could re-engineer the heating system. Um, but, um, uh, but I love building things. Um, but, but what happened was is uh, my brother got sick and he was diagnosed with ALS. Um, and ALS is one of these um, amazing moments where it just springs crystal clarity to life. It, uh, and it's a, it's, a, um, it's a fascinating disease. In fact, at some level, it's kind of a I hate to say it, it's a beautiful disease because it it, it, it it sort of comes after you with this clear warning and this steady pain of loss, but it doesn't cause a ton of pain and it doesn't 
change your mind that much. It sort of gives you this clarity in life. And the, and the to, to tell us, tell the audience, what is ALS? What ALS? Is? So ALS is a, a motor neuron disease that, um, what happens is that the, the motor neurons in your spinal cord that control your muscles um, cease operating and then die. Uh, and so your muscles stop working and they atrophy. Um, Stephen Hawking is sort of the most famous uh, uh, patient. And, um, and Stephen Hawking was a very odd patient and he lived a very long time and he had a very slow disease. Most patients live um, you know, about three years. So you, you go to the doctor, uh, you're 52 years old and uh, you're, 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 you're just at the prime of your life. You're, you bought your new house and your kids are in school and then suddenly everything's pulled out from under you. Um, and uh, you have to go through this process of managing um, being a, a fully functioning, healthy adult uh, to be unable to do anything at all, including breathe. Um, and, that, and that journey um, uh, challenges the medical system, it, it challenges families, um, uh, it, it is relentless in its demands that you learn uh, and you adapt, um, and it challenges the discovery system. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, we talk about rare diseases, ALS and MS are, are similarly prevalent. Um, the difference is that MS patients just live. <laughs> ALS patients don't, and so they just go away quickly. And uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm not minimizing MS, I'm not minimizing any of the disease, but it, it is something that's really pretty profound in that context. Um, and it makes for some really special clinicians that practice it. Uh, um, and uh, as a scientist, I find it to be just a, a wonderfully interesting problem um, uh, uh, at some level. But, but, but going through this, sorry. Um, so Stephen, I just give you the quick history. Stephen gets diagnosed. And he literally calls me, and you know, this, this is participatory doing medicine. So he, he calls me and he says, or participatory science, uh, the news doesn't look good from his EMG. Um, so we didn't have a diagnosis. He just has the technician telling him, oh, this doesn't look good. He knows what that means. I know what that means. Um, I uh, essentially, within three months, wrote a business plan to start an institute that's now in Cambridge that has 40 scientists and a $12 million operating budget, has been operating for 19 years now. I was the CEO for 10 years. Um, and that institute had one mission from the beginning, which is to do anything it could to get something in Stephen that would make him live longer. <coughs> and in 10 years, we filed eight INDs on Stephen. I'll repeat that. We, we did eight experimental treatments on my brother. Um, the first two were, uh, we didn't do all the treatments on Stephen, but we took them all through the process. The first one was a stem cell transplant using his own cells, um, and, uh, and in 18 months, for $2 million, we went from first meeting to needle in my brother's spine. And that included long-term rodent, primate, FDA, and everything in that time frame. Um, and so, uh, now, it didn't change his outcome. Um, it was what I call an ineffective treatment. Um, but uh, it demonstrated that you could essentially you know, legally, ethically, get something done if you felt it made sense and you followed the rules and did it well. And that was the genesis of my work in adrenal medicine. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, and um, one of the things that engineers do, I, I like to say engineers are really, really lazy. Um, they, they, uh, they hate work, and, and an engineer will spend a lifetime avoiding work. Uh, now, what does that mean? That means that if there's something that I could engineer that would make it so I didn't have to do something. I would work really hard at the something that prevented me from having to do something. My, my favorite example of this is my dad came home one day when I was about 13, and he, I had a bicycle um, taped to the lawnmower with duct tape, and I was trying to pedal my way around the yard <laughs> with the lawnmower on the front of these forks and this bicycle, trying to figure out how I could avoid pushing the lawnmower on the lawn. And my dad, of course, looks at me and says, without freaking out, because like the kid's pushing a lawnmower <laughs> on the lawn with a bicycle, um, and says, you know, Jamie, won't that take you longer to build than it would take you to mow the lawn for the rest of your life in this household? <laughs> and and he was of course right, but that wasn't the point. So engineers are lazy. So so I I asked the question, why? Why isn't there a treatment for Stephen? And um, and and why don't I have these information about how to improve Stephen's life? Um, um, and I'll give you, um, you know, two answers to that. And I, I spent my life working on this why the whole time. Um, and, and I think that part of the participatory medicine, participatory science process is that um, we have the right as 
patients to ask why. And the asking why forces the system to turn upon itself and say, why are we not performing? And, and that is, to me, the, the true power of this, is that, um, so I'll give you two questions from Stephen's why. One was, and this was sort of the foundation of patients like me, um, why, well, so Stephen has a ventilator, which means you get a trach in your, in your throat, you can no longer speak, um, you stop eating and you lose the feeding tube, but you can live on a ventilator, and I have these wonderful photos of Stephen driving his wheelchair and reading to his son with a computer while on a ventilator. She lived four or five years of really amazing, high quality life on a ventilator. Um, and when you're on a ventilator, you spend a lot of your life getting ready. Like, you can't, you need batteries, you need, you need you know, suction machines, it's, it's, it's sort of running a simple ICU in your home. And um, one of the really awful things is you get up every morning, you have to brush your teeth. And you know, when you're paralyzed, brushing your teeth is hard, you want to get all the teeth clean, you don't want mouth bacteria, you don't want bad breath, because you know, there's people hanging out with you all day, leaning over you. Um, and uh, my brother's a pain like me. Um, and, um, and so we, this patient told us about a toothbrush that had a suction tube in it. And you could put the, the toothbrush in the suction tube and then you could brush your teeth. And then you just hit the button suction machine and it wouldn't run off your body, it wouldn't rip all over you, it wouldn't destroy your dignity. Turns out you could only buy them at 144 toothbrushes per unit. You can't buy one, you gotta buy 144. <laughs> so we gotta go about 10 patients together, we all bought 144 toothbrushes, and we shared them with each other. And I'm sitting there thinking, why does no one know this? This is 10 minutes of dignity of every single patient's life on a suction machine. Why does no one know this? And so that was what patients like me was. How do you, how do you get that from the patients? Um, and now the other one was, um, you know, why doesn't Stephen have a treatment? And, um, and this is partly also the genesis of patients like me, but it's partly the genesis of my other work. I've started now five companies in the space. Um, it's because we don't know how to measure disease. It's because we don't understand how to quickly understand whether something works. And so if you ask me after 20 years, the fundamental why of how we can make medicine better, what's the really missing ingredient? The most important thing is having clarity and a simple answer on the, how quickly you can know that an intervention had an effect on an individual. Because the shorter that time is, the better medical system performs. You know, uh, you go back to your own story with Dave and, and, and all of that. You're looking at feedback loops, and the faster the feedback loop, the faster the learning. And it's true in discovery, the trials are cheaper, the experiments are cheaper, the, everything's cheaper. And so, um, you know, the, 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 to me, um, the measurement, the effective measurement of health and disease begets effective discovery and medicine, period. And that, and that, I think, was, patients like me, was built to deliver medicine's measurement, best measurement into the hands of patients. Um, and I'll go to this sort of very moment of it being started, which I've told a few times, but I like, which is that, that um, I'm a little obsessed, and it was probably not good for my marriage. Um, and so I was, you know, getting divorced after, in the middle of all of this thing, and I'm still very good friends with my ex-wife, so it, uh, it was a good divorce. But I'm at home, and, um, you know, I, I leave my work, and I'm, you know, and I go, and I'm sitting in my little room in the back of my house in the forest, and I've been here Danny and Newton, which is very funny. And, um, and I'm online dating. And you know, on the website, I'm like looking, and then I'm like trying to put in a brunette and other features that I'm looking for. And suddenly, by the way, I found this really nice brunette that I'm now with, and we have two great successful stem cell transplants in Newton schools. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the, um, but, but what I remember was the moment was I realized that, that um, Mash.com is just a clinical assessment tool. Characterizing parameters about someone's um, you know, well-being or attributes that you're interested in, just like the trials I was running. So I'm sitting here like, looking at my trial data, looking at, it wasn't Mash.com, I actually met my wife on the onion, but, but, um, but we're on the onion <laughs> on the update dating site, and, and, um, and I'm looking at this thing saying, it's just a clinical assessment tool. So patients like me was actually not a social network. It was actually originally a dating site for patients. Um, except patients can be polyamorous because you can do lots of them. Um, and, and you can exchange data. But the, but the really 
Um, the really amazing thing, and I think this is the funny part of the story, is that everyone thinks we're this you know, founding social network. And by the way, we started the company the month Facebook bought the domain Facebook, so you get a sense of how old this is, right? So we started the company the month Facebook bought the domain Facebook, but the social network was an accident. So uh, our technical co-founder, um, Jeff Cole, my brother and myself, we're at this meeting like four days before launch, and he says, this is really cool, this clinical assessment tool, patients can find each other, they can map each other. How about we put a forum in there so people can talk to each other. And we're like, that's a good idea. So we like literally put the forum in, in one afternoon, and then we became a social network. But it turned out it was really a clinical assessment tool, and the social network was a secondary part. Sorry, I'm, all right, being long with So we're, we're never gonna get to this. Let's session. fight, let's Maybe fight, let's go. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so let me ask you this. You've been doing this for 20 years now. Okay, now I thought after you started, you'd be out of it in a few years, you'd lose interest, you'd be onto something else. You've been doing this for 20 years. So well, what's kept you there and, and what, what have you learned? Uh, Joe just left and I was just talking to Joe about this. Joe, uh, was, was just, we were just talking about this. Like, hey, we're both a little grayer. We're all a little grayer. Um, you know, this is hard. Like this is hard. Uh, you know, too hard, but we wanted something else. No, 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 no. I, 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 I mean, maybe. I mean, I, it's funny. I, 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 I keep dreaming about like simple problems that you can actually solve. Um, uh, I, I think the reason we stay at it is that look, the world is not healthy. Um, we're not healthy. We don't live healthy lives. We don't live in healthy environments. Um, uh, um, for all of its strengths, capitalism is largely about you know creating demand by inducing anxiety and information asymmetries, which is essentially preying upon people that don't have data. And uh, healthcare isn't really any different than anything else in that. And and uh, it's funny. I used to expect it should be, but the people in healthcare are different. I mean, they want it to be better. And <coughs> I think the reason it matters is that if there's something that can help us as humanity um, be what we can be, it would be for us to understand what it means to be truly healthy in ourselves and help our children and our parents and our friends and our loved ones be healthy. And, and if we can measure that um, and build something around that, then, then I think we can build a great world and society. And I, so I think it's the only thing that Everything else is secondary. Um, the second thing is the problems are kind of interesting. Um, you know, and if you are a glutton, a, a glutton for punishment, which means you like losing most of the time, um, it's a really good place to go because you can you can go with these thorny problems and they just don't change. But, but you know, the, the stories like Ashley's, and, I mean, you get to change people's lives in a way, and and that's what makes it better. You just want to change more and more and faster and better. So I'm going to ask you one more question about patients like me, and then I want to turn to more participatory kind of healthcare questions. So um, some of you may know that um, patients like me was acquired by United Health Group uh, not that long ago. And that was a big deal for a lot of people. And uh, and and what does that mean? Does that mean that you sold out? What does that mean that, that now this incredibly rich uh, you know, patient community, uh, many patient communities actually, is now you know, owned by UHG and that your group is? What does that mean, Jamie? Well, we, we still haven't figured out what exactly we're gonna do with UHG as part of our business plan. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> well, I, no, no, I mean, look, that. Um, uh, I have to admit I was very surprised um, when um, UHG came to talk to us. Um, and not just because it was UHG, but, but we had tried to address the payer um, provider market about five years ago. And um, uh, it was not particularly receptive to really thinking about how to be patient-centered. And, and, and for all of its sins, um, and I like, this, I, I like pharma because it, some of them I call them the only honest criminal in healthcare, at least we know where they steal their money. Um, uh, they were really committed to being 
completion center, and they were doing real teeth to it. Um, and I think you can read into that, um, you know, an intention to really um, understand need and address the market directly. Um, what I will say is, um, you know, we, you know, we've been there for uh, four or five months now. Um, I, I think, again, this problem is hard. And what I see is a lot of really talented people trying to figure out how to bring alignment to making this better. Um, and uh, um, I don't think it's just United Health Group. I think that, that um, there's a lot of this going on to just try and figure out how to bring alignment to it. And I think that, that um, and that comes back to this group for a second, which is, um, I believe in this room and these ideas, there is a, um, a very vivid perception of real gaps that, um, that we have not been paying enough attention to in the world. And I think that, that I think what, what has been pioneered um, and, and for a very long time and, and, so much, and, and sadly undervalued by, by, you know, by, by you and by David and by other work that, that I've seen all over the place, um, uh, where people have been trying to bring attention to how patients can inform, how people, how humans can inform the system and how to be more human. And, um, uh, uh, and I think when you put work into that and training into that and you, you do it, you actually create more change. And, and um, so I think that, that um, I think the world is ready to really rethink this. Um, and, and that's exciting to me. So you view this as an opportunity for you to really change the world or change healthcare? Um, I mean, if you, um, you know, yes, I do. I think, no, I, I, think, I think what's, and, I, and I, the reason I say that is because I think, um, you know, for the first time, um, these systems have data and, and understanding that, that the consumers are coming and are going to demand things of them, that they have platforms and data and influence and intention to be positive. And I think that, that, that um, the, the degree to which we can bring some clarity and truth to that will make it better. And your team is not just, not only the Patients Like Me platform, there's much more than that that you're doing within United Health Group. Is that correct? Um, well, so, so the other work that we're doing, um, and this goes more to the, the other side of the equation I talked about with Stephen, um, and I think this talks about participatory science. So, I, look, um, I'm always a little bit of an odd personality in medicine because at some level I'm always looking at what's next after medicine. So I, I'm, I'm fundamentally a technologist, a discovery person, um, and I, you know, when I was thinking about what is medicine, right, which I think we don't really define stuff about that very well, you know, there's a part of medicine where you largely know what to do. There's a part of medicine where um, there are um, preferences that really matter, which I think is a large, a large part of the objective of participatory medicine, right? And this is doing that. And then there's a part of medicine where we really just don't have answers. And you know, and I came from ALS, where we don't, we don't have answers. And, and um, I, I think these are all more blurred than we tend to think about. But like in the part where we don't have answers, um, you know, I am profoundly excited about a coming change. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the example of that. And for those of us in the room who are oldest, um, in 1982, IBM released the IBM PC. Um, and, uh, and my parents bought one. Um, and it, it was $5,800 for the PC, the monitor, the color CGA, with two, with two 128K floppies, which is the upgraded version. Now, think about what $5,800 is, is in today's money, right? That's 30 years ago, right? Um, and uh, or longer. Um, uh, and um, that device um, changed the world in a really specific way, is that we went from a world where computing was institutional and single purpose. So either Wang for word processing or digital for, um, you know, sort of CAD and engineering or, um, or, or, or IBM for mainframe computing for, you know, accounting and systems. And it all just ended up in one box. And it ended up in a box where it was distributed to the hands of the people that used it. So they shot the professionals. They were gone. <laughs> and, and boy, 
you know, when you wanted to write software in 1979, you went to MIT. Anyone want to go to MIT to write a professional software system right now? No, you go out to the So what happened is that we distributed it to the people and the world changed in information. And I see um, individualized medicine based on digital biology is at that moment right now. That, that right now today, that we are about to distribute the ability to understand the human operating system, physiology, its relation to disease and aging, and health to everyone. And what I'm excited about is imagining Dave DeBronckhardt not equipped with a med medical record, they don't want to argue with the physician, but Dave DeBronckhardt equipped with a machine learning artificial intelligence tool that pattern maps every part of his individual physiology against every available treatment in the world and going and saying to you, I want to try this thing over here right now. And that demanding that this 15 year development and this 15 year deployment process that means that the things that we do in the world today are 30 years old in their ideas happen now for him today. And I don't think that's that far away. And I'm really excited about it. <clears throat> so that brings up a question. How do you, how would you instruct people, patients, to talk to their physicians about ordering things that may be sort of outside the mainstream, the kind of things you did for your brother. How do you have that conversation and how do you give your physicians some comfort with, with these things that they may not be comfortable with, they may not believe in? So, so this is really, um, this is where I have to sort of apologize to physicians um, a little bit. I've been a little. Should do that more often, by the way. I, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. Um, how's being right working for you? As my therapist said. Um, you know. Uh, yeah. Let, let's break this apart. Um, so the first thing is, um, uh, I think being a physician is hard, and I think generalizing from um, individual edge cases to the practice of medicine is not fair. And we talked about this before. I think that we <coughs> underestimate the responsibility. Like in this in anticipatory medicine, there is a responsibility to teach the patient to be responsible for themselves. It, it doesn't work without that. Just full stop. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that, that um, um, walking into an office, expecting someone to serve you up a menu of choices against your preferences, um, partially complying with the, with, the, with the outcomes of that, providing no feedback and then blaming the physician when it doesn't work is not participatory medicine. And that is largely a lot of the practice of medicine today. And so I think that, that, we, that, that the patients have to come to the practice of medicine with an understanding that the sort of false infantilization where medicine deploys itself on some subject as opposed to someone that is an active decider and in charge of their own destiny doesn't work. So I, I have come to believe that health can only be taken by the individual. It cannot be given to them. And so that a patient, to be healthy, we have to not get patients to comply, but we must get them to choose a path that is beautiful and attractive. And we have to make it that way. And any of the design exercise is just like, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves. It doesn't work, right? So the patients have to choose health, select it, and then take responsibility for it. Now the flip version of that, sorry. Wait, wait, we teach our kids this in second grade. What the hell will do us as adults, right? You know, so, so the second part of that is, um, you know, I, I, I just quote from um, um, Eric Topol, like the patient will see you now. Um, I, I think that the idea that the physicians get to be a gatekeeper is all such as bullshit, and, and that has to end. And the patient is a servant within the frames of their comfort space for what is ethical and appropriate in a transactional system, by the way. It is a commercial system. So let's talk about that. So um, when my brother had the stem cell transplant, um, it was done um, by a, a neurosurgeon named Fred Sidium. Um, and my brother and I sat in his office, and, um, and I looked Fred in the eye and shook his hand before we went, uh, about a week before the surgery, and, and we were signing the consent. And um, I said to Fred, Fred, if my brother dies on the table, my family will be eternally grateful to you. And, and Stephen repeated it. And so let's think about what it means that you take a physician, someone that's trained you know, 10 years of their life to understand some part of medicine, that they've gone through the tribulations and the accreditation and the respectability and the insults of the process, by the way, because it's not exactly fun, right? And, and 
And then they go and they work every day to help people. And someone asks you to put that at risk for some crazy idea that's not yours, that you're not trained or equipped to understand. I mean, and that's not, I mean, without weeks and months of work, we can all understand anything. You know, I think this is a transaction of trust. And um, we, you know, so when I say to a patient, if you want to do something different, you have to, you have to make the physician safe. Um, you know, physicians want to help people, but they also live in the real world. They also have children that have to go to college. They also have constraints. They also have institutional rules they can't break. And so you have to teach them, you have to make them safe. And I don't think we're very good at making people safe. I think actually we are entering an increasingly hostile transactional environment where if I was a physician, you know, I, I would be really cautious about helping a patient. And my first thing when I help an ALS patient now and I talk to them on the phone, um, which I still do about you know, once every few weeks when someone newly diagnosed finds me, I says, look, what, what do you want? What's your goal? And just listen. And if they say, I want to do everything possible to change the world, I will help them do that. But if they don't say that, I want to help them find what they feel safe for because you can't get someone to drive for that. So what you're saying is, uh, what I often say also, is you can't force someone to be participatory unless they're willing and equipped to do that. Yeah. I mean, I'd love, people laugh when I say this, but, but it's true. I'd actually love all my patients to be as engaged as Dave over here. I don't think you'd have the time. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, because I, it, it actually, as a physician, yeah. it's, it's much better to engage people on that kind of a level rather than in that, in, Infantilizing situation that yeah. many patients, this is a codependency problem, right? Patients are putting themselves in that position. Physicians are happy to take advantage of it. So, so that brings up a question then. Um, what, is, what is the patient's responsibility? So you talk, you know, we've had conversations before, you talk about patient agency, but also patient responsibility. And, and I think that the responsibility thing is, is, I think, really, really important and interesting. And especially so that, uh, you know, so if, if some of you have seen the uh, Involution is a, is a, a uh, local design company, some of you may work with them. Involution Labs does this great graphic, other people have done this as well, showing the different contributions to your health. And we in healthcare think that, oh, it's all about the medical care that you get. But it's not. It's not. It's a tiny piece of contributions to health. Really, it's, it's, it's your genomics, and much bigger, it's your lifestyle, and you know, the social determinants that we're gonna talk about later. So, so talk to us for just a few minutes about the responsibilities of patients, because that's what we're getting into here, versus the agency of patients. Um, so, um, I think we have to be a little careful when we talk about who is patients and what the purpose is, right? So, um, I largely break patients into sort of three rough categories. And they all are critical when you think about healthcare. Um, and people exist in different categories at different times, but, but there are what I call at-risk patients, um, where essentially for either um, economic or cognitive or training or whatever complicated set of reasons, um, they're not bringing their part of the bargain. They're not bringing what they need to the bargain. And, and we should, you know, that may be the social determinants problem, that may be a structural society problem, that may be a zoning problem, whatever set of things that, that make that the reason. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, I think there's a fair amount of evidence from other parts of this that laying responsibility on them is not solving the problem. We have to figure out how to make their world better, right? Then there's what I think of as sort of rational people. You give them the right information, um, and this is our experience basically thing. When we study compliance or all this stuff, the pharma says, oh, we want to study um, you know, why patients aren't compliant. And we come back to, well, they have a bunch of really good reasons, partly because your drug sucks, <laughs> um, and, and partly because you can see these other factors in their life. And in general, we think the patients are generally right about their non-compliance. And I think that there's sort of a, an assumption that because we believe something should be done, it's actually true in the real world, and so they lack context. So I think patients are really rational. And so it's about giving them the right information, the right solutions. And then I think there's this last group, and I think this is where, this is where medicine sort of bridges, um, or could bridge. Um, you know, Dave's changed the world. You know, my brother's changed the world. Um, uh, you know, Ashley is changing the world. The, the, 
um, the, the degree to which um, someone stands up, says this is unacceptable. There is a better way. And I'm going to find it, I'm going to demand it, and I'm going to share it. That changes the world. And, and that is the advocate or the high agency or whatever you want. And, and you know, um, I'll tell you what I've gotten. You know, you know what I know changes doctors' behavior? Those patients. Let's stop. Or do those doctors just dismiss those patients? Uh, in, in our platform, my favorite data point is the engaged patients. 12% of the patients who are engaged in patients like me fire their doctors. So the, the and that wonderfully coupled, I love that statement, like, because they should be fired, because they're not doing what they think. But what's also coupled with is that there's this also increase in the diagnostic confidence of the patient. So they either switch to a physician that gives them a better diagnosis, or they actually start to really believe in it. So it sort of creates a cycle of trust, right? So, um, you know, look, I mean, what was the joke? <coughs> Half of doctors in the top 10%, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and the rest of them are above average, right? You know, so, so um, you know, we don't have perfect people, we don't have perfect systems, uh, and it's not always the physician's fault, it, you know, the, the systems are often broken. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, yeah, you have a forced choice, you gotta make a difference. Um, uh, but I, I do think, you know, um, we have tried moving the cheese a little bit in the payer side, and moving it around and distributing responsibility in different ways. We have tried, um, you know, adding information and, and, and you know, um, you know, and, and evidence. Um, you know, I'll give you two interesting facts, guys. So there's, in the last two years, um, um, two really interesting papers come out that really are found. One is the WHO has reversed the 30-year standing recommendation that antibiotic courses should be finished. They said there's no evidence that it ever made sense. That it seems to be inducing resistance to antibiotics. And we do no longer believe this makes sense. And I, you read the paper carefully. There's a few instances where it's not the case. But in general, this basically says we should no longer be asking patients. And there was never any reason to ask patients to finish the antibiotics course. The new recommendation is you should take antibiotics until the patient feels better, a little bit longer, and then let the immune system finish the job. How much does that change medicine? Anyone think that antibiotic resistance is a problem? <laughs> right. So, so we have. Like the, the world's most leading body of evidence just says it's a bad idea, it's not changing. The other one is um, my favorite one. I used to stand up and say, there's a few things in medicine that know really well. If you present in an ER with rebound pain in the abdomen and you have um, a whole of your symptoms, you have appendicitis and it should be removed. It turns out 80% of the time you don't really need to do that. <laughs> and which is another paper that came out, um, which you know makes me go back to thinking about how much part of your healthcare made off of my appendicitis uh, 15 years ago. Um, uh, so, you know, so I, I think that evidence isn't changing the system. I think what changes the system is the person getting cut, taking the drug, and going home and living, making a better choice with their physician. Well, that's great. I'm gonna leave you with, I'm gonna ask you one last question, then we'll see if there's just a couple of quick questions from here, because we've, we've been going on long. This was fascinating. The last question is, what does participatory medicine mean to you? Um, I've always loved the doctors I've worked with, but it largely meant they did what I asked. <laughs> um, what does participatory medicine mean to me? Um, I asked you first. No, I, 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 I know. <laughs> um, I, I believe that what it really means is that we build systems that transfer the responsibility and information to make the choice to the person living the life that is the consequence of that choice. And so participatory medicine means giving patients, and I'll use this for my own brand, um, let me tell you what I want it to be. I can imagine a world where we record and understand and digitize the anecdote of every encounter in all of healthcare and medicine and life. And we provide a tool like Google Maps that helps someone look at how everyone else went from point A to point B on the map and choose 
the path that's best for them. And sometimes they might need to call a physician to do something that requires a license to make the right choice and enable it. That, that's what I believe participatory medicine can be. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so um, we'll see if you have time for maybe two questions. Because we have a little bumps back there. My trouble. You know what? I think I, I'm informed that we, we've run over a little bit. Uh -oh. So, uh, so I, I, I enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed hearing from uh, Jamie Haywood, the CEO of Patients Like Me. And uh, I, I always find it fascinating. We didn't have long enough to actually start fighting. Yeah, about we, but if we had a little more time, maybe at the reception, we'll be fighting about but it. But I, I got to say, though, I just want to say um, thank you for doing this. Um, uh, I know we all have more gray hairs than we thought. But I, I do think this is going to work. And, uh, and one of my intentions is to be more supportive of all the efforts, because I think that we have been, um, I think that we could do better at supporting the, everyone that wants to make this better, rather than figuring out which of us is doing it the best. So, uh, thank you. Jamie Hayward, thank you. Next, uh, we have a really fascinating panel uh, called Healthcare Impressionism, and I think that Janice and Kevin are going to be introducing the panel. Is that correct? Kevin Freer, that will be you. And Janice, is that true that you are introducing the panel? Or are we going to have Danny introduce it? Actually, Danny's going to do it. Okay, Danny is going to do it. I, so I will introduce you, Danny Van Leeuwen uh, of Health Hands. He is uh, one of our longtime members and uh, leaders of the organization. So, Danny, come on up here and kick off the panel. I'll bring you the chairs up here. And the panelists should run the back, get a microphone, and come on up here. my circumstances, uh, my physical environment. And I'm really happy to say that uh, for the first time in my life, I would say over the last five years, I am living at peak performance. And that is a hoot and a half. <laughs> so what I would like to do is to thank you. What I'd like to do is, um, would you guys uh, introduce yourselves? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lisa Fitzpatrick. I also wear a lot of hats, but I don't have a cool jacket like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am a physician. I'm trained in infectious diseases and public health. I worked for the CDC for many years. Um, after which, I returned to academic medicine, had a run at Medicaid as the chief medical officer in DC. 
and since have decided to leave all that behind to start a business called Grapevine Health. And what we're focused on is improving health literacy and patient engagement for underserved populations. And we focus a lot on um, telling people stories and sharing those stories with other folks <coughs> in their community to help them make health decisions. So happy to talk more about that uh, later on. Hi, my name is Keanu J. Wynn. I am a current doctoral student in Harvard School of Public Health in Population Health Sciences, which means that I study how to make populations as a whole healthier. I also have a Master of Bioethics, um, which is related, and currently I actually work on personal and social responsibility for health and thinking about um, that in the context of social determinants of health, which I will talk about a little bit later as well. And thank you for having me. I'm Janice Tufty. I'm identified as a patient partner, which is what I am. I'm very engaged with health systems improvement research, health services research. I um, am involved with quality improvement work, guidelines and measurement, and, uh, and present a lot. So I'm happy to be on here today. I'm very involved with social determinants health and small projects that I developed myself in Seattle and worked on for over a decade. Hi everyone, my name is Pablo Butron de la Vega. I'm a primary care provider at Boston Medical Center, Boston University. I mainly uh, serve a, a clinical population of Hispanics, mostly undocumented. And I'm very passionate about the patient's uh, perceptions about their health, how to explore those, how to capture them. And I'm very passionate about social factors and how that influences health. I'm the clinical director of Thrive at our institution. Thrive is a, is a program that has the goal of screening all our patients and exploring what are their social needs, the good ones and the ones that also make it hard for them to be healthy, and provide that information to all the teams so that we can better understand how to help them, and hopefully uh, going more in the community level to give them the same opportunities so that they can thrive and be healthy. And uh, I also work with uh, a lot of graphic organizers. So I, I use mind mapping to make a graphic organizer of ideas. And I get my patients to draw mind maps of their health so that I can understand them better and they can tell me more about what it is to live their lives and then take those maps to their community so that they can share it with, with all and hopefully share the knowledge. Thank you. So when I think about social determinants of health, uh, well, to me, social determinants of health was an idea created by academics. Um, when I think about social determinants of health, I think about life. Um, I think about circumstances. I think about living conditions. We don't talk about social determinants of health for people with voice, power, and resources. So in this during this panel, I charge you all with thinking about what action does this motivate you to take in your practice or your advocacy uh, to, uh, yeah, what action does, does this take? And so let's start with um, the, the first question is, um, how can we open seats at the decision-making tables for underrepresented individuals and communities? And when I talk about seats at the table of decision-making table, I'm thinking about healthcare governance, design, operations, and research. Are we gonna pass the mic down? Yeah, okay. I, I think this has to be done by intention, and it has to come from the top of the organization in a lot of ways. Because if those people are not invited, to the table, they'll never be at the table. This is a stretch, I think, for a lot of people in C-suites or people who are sitting on boards because they don't understand that people in community can add a lot of value and they can help them understand things they don't know about their decision-making process. So if that's too far of a leap, um, one thing I suggest to leaders is to just walk around and talk to people in your organizations. Um, I recently gave a talk at a pharmaceutical company. 
which I will not name. <laughs> and um, we, we talked about this, about how to increase the voices of community um, in research and conversations that we're having across the organization. And someone said, someone who worked in the organization um, said, I'm so glad you said that because the, the woman who empties my trash, I spoke to her in Spanish one day and she said she's been working here for 14 years and no one has ever said hello to her. So even in the organization, just talking to people is enough to make people feel seen and then that could lead to people feeling like they're heard or having an opportunity to, to offer suggestions. So it just starts with little steps, but I would love to see a community member on every single board of every organization, especially in healthcare, but we have a long way to go. So um, I will say, I think I am one of those academics that you were referencing in the beginning. So my field of study is actually in social determinants of health. And so when we think of social determinants of health, it can mean a broad array, array of things, but for the purpose of this, I believe we're thinking of housing, nutrition, education, um, employment status. And so in addition to um, a community member, which I think is wonderful in healthcare organizations, I think we also have to have people who train in public health, and that can be an MPH, it can be a PhD, um, but I, I don't know if you've mentioned this, but 20% of health outcomes is explained by healthcare and 80% is explained by the social determinants of health. I believe that's roughly the statistic. And so having someone who trains in such fields who can think about these things in a way that medical professionals are not trained to think about these things, which is acceptable, they're different jobs for a reason, um, is important to really bring that into the fold if that's what we're serious about, bringing into the fold. Um, as a patient partner, and I am involved with governance, but I agree with everything both of you have said. Um, it's extremely important to have community members um, on your governance, on your boards, on your co-design, human-centered design, as well as I also believe your advisory uh, groups. The advisor groups often are able to then get into research or other areas around your institutions. We'll go to those advisors to uh, realize how they could expand their knowledge and have more, use their skills that they have and uh, be more involved. But um, to reach out, I, I belong to quite a few organizations that are mostly Caucasian white. And um, I always, I, my community, I'm a Muslim, is primarily people of color. And so I'm always, I'm always immersed in different communities. I'm also involved with healthcare for the homeless in King County. And um, so I work with a lot of communities that are either compromised and or perhaps may appear vulnerable or ostracized. And it's very important to understand that the only way you can do that is going out into the communities, in my opinion, and find, you know, meeting them where they're at. And so uh, that's something that I recommend doing if you haven't been already. I personally think that it's, it's mainly very important to um, for the involvement, besides having an intention, is uh, it's it's part of a good strategy, and I think it's important to take a step back and think about why social determinants suddenly are so like a big topic now. We've known the eighty percent of our health outcomes is social determinants for 50, 60 years. So why suddenly something is such important that we already knew about it? And unfortunately, for the bad reasons, but we'll take it. It's all about, right now, it's tied to money. Especially here, now, if you can improve health outcomes and you can save money, and now everybody knows that if you don't tackle the social determinants, you cannot improve health outcomes. So because of this, the governance structures that decide how we're gonna take a strategy to solve social determinants of health are different. Before, it was mainly researchers or people that were really interested on solving social determinants of health. But there was no strategy team, there was no leadership from, for example, of the hospital. Uh, it was not. But now the teams are much more complex, <coughs> so you need a patient here. And I'll give you an example of what happened to us. We started Thrive uh, probably three years and a half ago. And the first thing that we needed to do was to develop a screening tool. How do you ask the patients about their social needs? 
and in the table there was the providers, there was the leadership from the strategy team, there were the researchers, and we had a lot of trouble deciding which are the questions that we're going to ask. Did we have patience at the beginning? No. And at some point the conversations were really, really hard. It was really hard to get to a consensus. So that's when we realized that the best strategy was to make the patients the final decision makers. So we went to the community and asked them, how do you think about, what do you think about asking you these questions this way? How about if I ask you about education this way? And for example, education is a good example. We were asking them, do you have a, do you have a GED? And, and most of the patients were feeling very offended about this. They were like, no, don't ask me that way because I'm not gonna answer any questions. So we took it back to the committee and they said like, no, no, but that's the evidence-based question. But 90% of the patients said they won't answer. That's your answer. And that helped us figure out what's the best strategy. And that's what we do now. If there's no consensus, we go back to the patients and they are the final decision makers that help us develop these strategies to address social determinants. I just wanted to, to point out something you said that I think is very important, and it is systematic throughout the healthcare system, all the innovation work that's happening now. And you said that you all, you set out to, to create something, and then you went and asked the patient afterwards. And I, and I think I love that you brought that out, because this is something that we keep doing over and over and over again. We're building things without asking people if it's something they want or something they want to use. And I, I hope that at least the people in this room, when we leave here today, that would be the one thing that we get right. If we want to build something, change something, create something new for patients, that we ask them first, not after it's already been thought about, or worst case scenario, it's already been built. And then we ask, well, why aren't they coming? Or, why are they so difficult to engage? It's because we didn't incorporate them in the very beginning. Thank you. I want to tell a little story here. So I work for this, I work for an organization that included their, the people they supported at every level of their governance, including the board. And when I first started the job, I went to a board meeting and there was uh, a man who was on the board who had uh, some severe mental illness. And he started talking and he was like, what sounded to my naive ears, this stream of consciousness uh, rant, frankly, at how I heard it. And I'm thinking this, you know, my mind is going, not really listening to him. And, um, and then I'm looking around and everybody is quiet and everybody is listening. And after about four minutes, and four minutes is a long time, um, the gentleman stopped talking and the person who was chairing the meeting said, John, you just really said a lot. Let's take a minute and think about what you said. And again, I was, you know, my, a little voice, you know, on my shoulder was going, what is going on here? Um, People are like listening and they're stopping and they're thinking. And so after about 20 seconds of me running this you know, insidious little voice in my head, um, I stopped and started thinking about what did this, what, what was this gentleman saying? And then after a minute, somebody said, well, you know, I think I heard this. And somebody else said, I think I heard that. And John's nodding his head. And we actually, uh, the, the subject of the moment was um, families' satisfaction with the service that they were receiving from the organization. And what he had said in his four minute, what I described as a rant, was that um, when staff turns over, we lose contact with somebody that's really important to us and we trust, and there is no transition, which was like this incredible insight that then, bless the organization, they did something about. So I'm telling you this story because it is not easy to include 
people who are not the people you usually see around the table uh, in a conversation. And it's really challenging to listen. And it's really challenging then, even if you do all that, to actually do something. So I guess I would then ask, you know, uh, I would ask the question about, so how have you experienced this listening to people at the seats of governance who are not the usual C-suite leadership people, but community members. How have how has how has the business, the process, the service, the research, the whatever changed based on in your experience on that uh, inclusion? It, for, for us as an institution, it's changed a lot. I think it's, it's, uh, it's giving us the knowledge of when is the right time to engage every member of the team. And the patients are part of the team. So when do you engage the community? When are you ready to do it? And when is the right time? And, but the main, main thing is that you want them to always be engaged. And for us, it's, been, it's giving us the platform to do it. We didn't have any experience where I can show leadership. Yes, if you always have a patient there, or if the patient is the final one that decides, that's going to give a good outcome. But now our project is the signature of our team that we can show. Yeah, you can do it, and if the patient is always there, you're going to have good outcomes. Because before, if you think about all the screening processes in the hospital, maybe 50% of the patients will answer the questionnaires. Now ours is 90%. Why? Because we did it with patients, because we knew when to get them involved and really make them part of it. They own the process. Patients come to the clinic when I see them and they give me ideas of how to get it better without me even asking them. So if they are part of the research team without even uh, having to do anything else because they've been involved since the beginning. So I think that's the key that has given us the knowledge of how, what's the best process and what's the best timing of when to involve the community and the patient. Um, I'm a patient partner, and uh, I consider myself that uh, many years ago, maybe a decade ago at plus, I was in governance at Group Health um, Cooperative in Washington State, which was a very progressive, well-known health system. We were member owned, we owned members, we owned the co-op. And um, Kaiser purchased us a few years ago, but um, through governance, I was asked to be on a research project. Truthfully, I was, pretty uh, cynical about research at the time. It was a PCORI grant. It was one of the very first PCORI grants, very first cycle that was uh, funded. And um, so I learned a very steep learning curve very quickly. There was two of us patient co-investigators on the project. We um, developed out a community clinic liaison uh, position, uh, which is now called a community resource specialist. And it was, the intervention was so successful, it's now been scaled across all 26 clinics at Kaiser and Washington State which is addressing really social determinants of health, uh, uh, the other parameters outside of the standard view that are there. But um, you do have to, it, I think Danny Sands brought up something very important earlier, where listen to the patient for a minute, listen to the people, and this Danny also mentioned, it's important to listen. I'm one of those kind of people, a stream of consciousness, but I do have a purpose behind it. If people don't get too bored, they will hear something. So um, we all have our own mode. I've had traumatic brain injuries, and I'm sure that's part of it. So you never know people's backgrounds and give them a few minutes and um, really listen to them and just meet them where they're at and think from trauma-informed care. I think we've all gone through some trauma, and it's a good way to look at life. I think the question was, how can we better listen to patients in our governance boards? and healthcare governance boards. And so I don't work in healthcare governance boards, but I am an equity, diversity, and inclusion fellow at School of Public Health. So I do work on boards. So instead, what I can answer is just like, how do we listen to very difficult, hard conversations? And so whenever people of color, URM, introduce spaces, I think, well, I know a lot of people don't want to hear what you have to say, because what you're going to say is going to be very uncomfortable. You're going to talk about racism, you're going to talk about sexism, you're going to talk about Islamophobia, you're going to talk about things that make people uncomfortable, 
and when you get uncomfortable, you shut down and you say, no, that's not me and you're not describing me and this is a system and there's nothing that I can do to fix the system. And being, I would say, I could go on about this for a minute, but I would say being knowledgeable about the fact that you are shutting down is the first step. No, you, I'm not gonna get into if someone's saying that you are representative of these things because I do not know everyone individually. But what I can say is that when we talk about the social determinants of health, we talk about structures. And dismantling structures takes a lot of concentrated effort, but listening is the first step and not and listening actively, which means that you can't shut down when you have these conversations. I'm gonna just talk about the first part of your question, which was how have you experienced listening? Because I, I think I already stated, I don't think we're doing a very good job at listening to community at the highest levels of organizations. But I, I, I think one of my superpowers is listening. It wasn't always, I had to practice it. And I think it is a skill that you can develop. My patients um, tell me things a lot that are very, you know, things that are very humbling about the way I and my colleagues practice medicine. Things like, we don't understand what you all are saying. Do you, do you have to use those big words? Or, and if any of you have watched some of my videos, you've heard some of this um, from the people I talk to on the street about how doctors speak in confusing language. So I think just listening um, to their feedback and making sure when I'm in conversations with them that we're actually having a conversation and it's not me doing all the talking and that I'm listening. Um, the, the other thing I wanna share though is I've been uh, part of the caregiver team for my father recently. And he's taught me a lot about listening, not just as a daughter, but as a healthcare professional. So after surgery, and he had surgery and he was um, lying in bed with the, um, uh, the well, they, they're called SPDs, but they're the, the um, holes you have on so that you don't get uh, blood clots. They weren't compression socks, but anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we were trying to keep him from getting blood clots. So he's lying there in bed, and he's, he's very quiet. For the longest time, he doesn't say anything. And then all of a sudden, he says to the nurse, didn't you tell me I have to wear these on my legs so I wouldn't get blood clots? So he was clarifying what he heard. And she said, that's right. He said, well, I see people sitting around all day long and they don't have to wear these. Why do I have to wear, worry about blood clots? And to me, that was, listening to him in that moment helped me realize how many times I've failed to give clear information to people or to make sure they understand why we're asking them to do things. And so this is something that I think we all need to work on, whether we're in healthcare or not. We, we take for granted that people know what we're talking about because we're not listening effectively. I think you asked a very different question, but that's what I wanted to answer. <laughs> that I think is interesting about the conversation about social determinants of health, life, circumstances, whatever you want to call it, is that we expect a lot from our medical system that I don't think they're equipped to provide. And I'll give an analogy, which is that sometimes I think we expect schools to raise our kids. <laughs> and they're not prepared to raise our kids. That's our job. So how, how, can you, can, you, can you guys speak to that? Like what is the responsibility of the medical industrial complex in trying to affect, improve, address people's circumstances. Okay, I don't want to go first all the time. <laughs> I can speak. Um, so um, stay tuned in because I 
feel like what I'm gonna say is gonna make people uncomfortable, so stay with me. Um, but I, I don't think that it's the, it's the job of the medical profession to solve the social determinants of health. The medical profession and healthcare just gets the most funding. And so since you have the most funding and you're what's recognized as the system to solve or where you go for when you are sick, um, it's what we look to, but we have to remember that by the time a person sees a doctor, they're already ill. If we want to move towards a preventative system where patients are coming to you for preventative care, where patients are coming to you um, for routine checkups, then we have to intervene higher upstream, which means that we have to think about the social determinants of health, which gets into a little bit of responsibility and um, kind of, well, this is kind of what my work is on, but thinking about, okay, so how do we make people more responsible? And I, I don't think that that's the, I don't think that's the right question at all. Um, if we want to think about the social determinants of health in the context of responsibility, it means going, okay, if you live in a bad neighborhood with no green space, and let me clarify bad neighborhood because we can take that out of context. If you live in a neighborhood that is underserved, so you don't have a supermarket that you can get to by walking, which means that your food, your food insecure, or you live in what's called a food desert. If you don't have a green space so you can go out and play or your kids can play or you can take walks to reduce your blood pressure. If you don't have all of these things um, by nature of where you were born geographically, by nature of your race, by nature of your gender, assigned sex at birth, by, by nature of all of these societal structures, then how can you possibly go to the doctor and be as healthy as a person who was born with these advantages? And so because of that, we have to think more upstream and I just, the medical profession isn't going to be the one to solve that. It's going to have to be redistributing funds to solve such societal problems. Mm -hmm. I would argue <laughs> that, um, I would augment that by saying the strategies we're using to address the so-called social determinants um, leave a bit to be desired. And I like to use stories to illustrate my point so that you don't think that I'm just being opinionated. <laughs> um, I talk to patients on behalf of uh, Medicaid health plans, and, and I'll just quickly tell you two instances to make you think a little bit about how we're addressing social determinants. The first one is a woman who is deemed to be food insecure. They send a box of food to her house every week. She sent me a video after we talked about what comes in the food. She doesn't like it. They never ask her what kind of food she likes or if she cooks or if she has access to food. So they send this food to her house and she sent me a video when the next bag came and, it, and showed me what they sent her. And there's only one thing in the bag that she's going, she was going to eat and that's uh, a little pail of granola. The rest she either couldn't recognize, it looked very unappealing to her, but yet this was an SDOH intervention her plan had designed for her. The second one is a young lady who used the emergency room 13 times in six months. And she was on my list because I was trying to talk to people who were using the emergency department but who had not seen their primary care doctor. They have provided lift transportation services so that she could get to the doctor. Well, it turns out she has a car, she likes her doctor, and when she wants to go and see her doctor, she drives herself. So the question is, if we're going to solve these problems, certainly not from uh, the medical standpoint, but as a society, we have to be more strategic about how we're thinking about um, how do we address these problems. Um. I have a lot going on in my head, but um, there's a lot of innovative programs from um, the national level down to local, and I appreciate what um, you both shared. And in Seattle, where I'm from, we have really innovative programs where we have multiple food banks for various ethnic groups. Um, I serve, I'm, I'm a Medicaid recipient, Medicaid expansion, I serve on Medicaid for the state, so we, we're very integrated in our, in our system of that, being sure that people are able to share what's needed in communities. Um, we're hoping to implement sooner uh, at some point where there could be food bags given from the hospital when people leave, but like you said, it has to be appropriate, and you can't just give it to people. You have to see if they're able to cook. They could be homeless. They might not have it. Um, we're also involved. We have a 
we have a wonderful program for uh, internet, which is $9.95 for anybody at a certain uh, income level. Any schools, that there's a certain percentage of school lunches, the whole school receives internet at $9.95 a month. And we have, you can get from the libraries free hotspots. This is huge today with digital divide that's happening and it does really count for it into our healthcare. And um, for transportation, we have discount programs for individuals and quite a few programs for seniors. But basically it's, um, I want to tell a quick story too. I was in the hospital recently for my digestive disease and the woman came in next to me and she uh, had one previous, you know, a hospital mate. The second one came in and she was very talkative and turned out that she was in there because she'd taken insulin and didn't have food. And I really am not very aware of, I have a lot of friends that are diabetics, but I'm not, I don't know a lot of the nuances. Well, it turned out that she took her insulin because she knew she should, but she hadn't eaten and she lived with her brother. You know, he had food and so she asked him for some food. He gave her a bologna sandwich or something, but at this time she was already very sick and went into a diabetic coma. I mean, reached one of the hospitals in a diabetic coma for two days. The nurse came in and um, mentioned to her, you know, we have Meals on Wheels and a few other resources. This woman knew all of them, but she didn't have the agency how to how to call up and to get the food or, you know, she could actually, her brother could have taken her to the food bank or she could call up and have it delivered, but she just didn't have that agency of thinking ahead. And I really see we need some major, um, some major changes where if people are using food banks, they could use them preventative with their food stamps and other opportunities. So I don't know how we can kind of teach this, but there are opportunities to address, I believe, a lot of hospitalizations that really could be uh, mitigated if we had proper people in the proper places being able to really share with the communities that on the spot. I personally think that um, we do have a responsibility, uh, especially because we are not doctors anymore, we are healthcare providers. We're trying to get people to be healthy. And if we don't consider the, the social determinant of health, uh, it's, it's really hard to get patients to, to try and be healthy. So I do think that we have a responsibility, but I don't think we have the responsibility to solve it. I think we have the responsibility to know how to respond. It's the same thing as a primary care provider. If I have a patient with a heart attack, I'm not responsible to fix that coronary artery, but I'm responsible to know how to respond to that. How do I connect this patient to a cardiologist that can do the procedure? So I see it the same way. So at the individual level, I do think that we have a responsibility of knowing, of capturing the social needs when the patients come to see us. Because if a patient is homeless, I'm gonna change my whole management if the patient is diabetic. If the patient is food insecure, I'm going to change the whole management. If I don't know that, then I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to share a treatment that's not going to be effective. So I really need to get the patients and explore what are their social needs so that I can really target that. But before that, I think we have, as, as, as a medical professional, we have the responsibility to teach the new generations about social determinants of health and how it is important. If social determinants are 80% of health outcomes, a big portion of the curriculum of a med school should be how social factors affect health, how they affect your heart attack patients, how they affect your diabetes patients. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do simulations and, and help them understand what poverty is, what privilege is. That at an individual level. I think at the individual level, as an institution, we need to set up as a good structure so that we can connect the patients to the different resources that are out there, but in a meaningful way. As you were saying, if, if I implement a project where I'm sending food to their houses, that's not going to be enough. I really need to know what type of food is that patient going to eat? What does it make sense to them? So it's about getting them involved from the beginning. But I do think that we have a bigger responsibility of being advocates. Because the main change to solve social determinants of health is pushing our institutions and our state to make massive innovation and massive uh, put out money in the community so that we can improve the community uh, systematic barriers that the patients are there, uh, having no access to education, no access to green space, no access to school. And we as a medical profession have a privilege and we have to use that privilege advocate for these changes in our leadership and at the policy level as well.
So we have about 10, 15 minutes, and uh, I would entertain uh, questions and comments uh, from the audience. Here. Yeah. Yeah. one technology that you could use to help with social determinants of health. So I know Janice mentioned internet, cheaper internet. Can you think of anything else? So we're talking digital maybe, health here. Instead. Maybe a technology that allowed people to make money. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. poverty is driving all of this. So we need to fix that. So there's a few programs, and I mentioned this earlier, but um, I'll start at, at the higher level. HR 4004 is coming up. It's a act, bipartisan act on social determinants of health where they're going to develop a 30-person um, convening of individuals from all different stakeholders to see what is the, perhaps some of the better ideas around social determinants of health, and this is Congress, right? And um, below that, uh, there's a few other ones, but um, gravity is a, I guess is the interoperability. I, I'm not really smart in this area, but it's a, a part of Siren out of um, UCSF, and you know, I know it. Um, anyway, it's uh, HL7 and Fire, and then there is also a Thrive Local that Kaiser is going to roll out this next year, and that's um, a, 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 na a nationwide KP Kaiser integrated, similar to what your Thrive is. So. Um, and there's also something called Chronic Medicare Advantage Plan. They, they were rolled out, I think, 50 of them this year, where it's a flexible opportunity for um, health systems themselves, payer, pay, you know, providers, payers, to develop their own flexible opportunities uh, for addressing social determinants health. This will come out in Medicare Advantage in 2020. Uh, I think one thing that could be used as, a, as technology, and I was thinking while they were presenting to patients like me, if you think about the, your patients that have uh, adverse social determinants, like housing insecurity, the ones that are able to figure out how to navigate the system have a lot to say. So imagine if you could have a network where the, the patients don't only share how they were able to go from A to B in their medical diseases, but how they go from A to B in their social determinants. How, did I, how was I able to get a section A? How was I able to get food? Uh, what's a good place? Where do I go? So then you can share that. That would be extremely powerful so that everybody would know how to manage that. Do you have another question? Yeah. Yes, hi, thank you. Thank you to the panel. Hi, my name is Kate Burke and I'm an emergency physician. I work with uh, patients like me. I really enjoyed your comments. Uh, I think Dr. Fitzpatrick hit the nail on the head when you spoke to the fact that your conversations with your community and your patients were saying that the language we were using was too complicated. Um, I have a very deeply held belief after 30 years of practice that um, healthcare is definitely a second language. And especially uh, in my field, meeting many different people who speak different languages along with healthcare being a different language, that the importance of communication and communicating what we want our patients and their families to do, that it's difficult for people to remember much of what is said, whether it's in an emergency department setting or in an office setting. And what I have found over the years originally with flip phones, leaving messages with our social workers, nutritionists, clinicians as a message with, when necessary with our interpreters, as a message to be shared with families. Because uh, oftentimes families are not with patients necessarily, but they definitely want to know what was said and what was done. And then now uh, the whole notion of recording what is being said 
uh, at the time when patients are leaving our encounters, whether it's in the office uh, or in another setting, with all of the different types of information you share, that there are ways that we can make our patients' lives better just by sharing more openly and communicating more clearly and taking that time just before they're leaving us to <clears throat> share the information in a way that they can use to play it again. Healthcare is a second language. How we learn is through repetition. Sometimes my patients need to listen to something three or four times. Their family needs to listen. I think we have some tips, some techniques at our fingertips that we can use, and they're available to us now. <coughs> Anybody else? Back in the room there? Hi. Um, addressing one of the last couple of questions and comments. There's a, a study, I believe it's been replicated, um, that used African American diabetic patients as coaches. Um, the te technological element involved, this is an old study, it was before we all had smartphones, uh, it was based on cell phones. We have a lot of have the, the rhetoric of the digital divide and have different ethnic groups and um, socioeconomic levels uh, about technologies. Well, as it happens, when they designed this study, African Americans were actually ahead of the rest of the population in cell phone use. And they also had a patient population that had difficulty getting to their appointments and just access to healthcare. So they said, why don't we take some of our patients and ask them if they want to be coaches, pay them to be coaches, and let them do peer support. They structured it as a study. It produced measurable improvement in A1C. And it was an extremely low-cost solution. At the time, it was advanced technology. I think it's been replicated once. I don't think there's been any modeling of that into the healthcare system since. There's a lot of things that we are doing as, as healthcare right now, like for example, uh, figuring out ways of how to better communicate with our patients, uh, how we can record our, our, our last uh, kind of words of wisdom to the patients so they can go back, and we're doing precision medicine, and we're doing coaching, uh, all these things that do show difference in the studies. When, when I see my patients every day, I, I had my clinic session this morning, and I had, uh, I had this patient that I know them really well. And there's all the resources out there for, for my patient. But until he gets uh, a house and he's at a stable housing, until he doesn't have to worry that he's not gonna have food for his kids tomorrow, until that, he's not gonna take his medications. He's not gonna be able to have a coach to, to be with him. And if we don't solve these systemic barriers, the patient's minds are not ready to be there. And if I will be, I was thinking about him today, and if I will be in the same position as him, I will be spending any time, any of my time, in doing anything else besides trying to get a home for tonight and trying to get food for tomorrow. So that's where I think all the resources should, be, should go first. Once we figure that out, then we should start thinking about, okay, now let's, Let's figure out what's the best treatment for this illness and for this other illness, because our patients' minds and bodies are gonna be ready to be able to engage. I think that um, there's a couple things. One is, I 
the term social determinants, I believe, is more social influences or social responsiveness, and that's the way to think of it. But the truth is, everybody can make a difference. And um, 13 years ago, I started make, creating these Muslim resource guides, and for, for the community to have, to, and it's online, and it's hyperlinked through all the services that, that uh, really anybody can have. It's not just for Muslims, but we're trying to do outreach. And so, Really, one person can make an effect, and just like patients like me, how they started that, you know, a couple people started it and moved forward, and everybody is be able to make a difference and have the ripple effect. Um, my last words would be um, to echo um, what Dr. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, don't, I wanted to call you Pablo, but I wanted to, they don't like to go by your first name, Dr. Pablo, but um, to echo what. <laughs> Um, he said is that there has to be more training and understanding of the social determinants of health in the medical community, not because it is your responsibility to solve it, but just because understanding it makes you better. And I think there are, are better providers. I think there are two like, key things that go into that understanding. It's one, that there is a big conflation between health and health care. And so health care is the care you receive at your doctor, but health, if we are going to adopt the social determinants of health lens, is everything that goes into overall well-being and that includes housing environment nutrition health care so it's one of the things that make up health and um, the other is that social determinants of health is actually a competing theory with the biomedical model and so social determinants of health is that disease is spread um, because of all of these social inequities and in housing environment nutrition in the biomedical model say that disease is caused by deviations from normal functioning within the human body I'm not saying that you have to believe either one of these things, but a deeper understanding um, of it will allow you to see that we're actually describing two very different ways that diseases are spread throughout society. Um, and it's not that one is an offshoot of the other, but it's that someone who said, I don't believe, I want to argue with this. And you can like both, you can like either one, but it is its own substantial theory. That's what I just Um, first, I want to um, thank and acknowledge the gentleman who made the last comment about um, black people having uh, higher cell phone penetration because people ask me this all the time. And they think it's a, a barrier to innovation for low income populations. And it's just not true anymore. Even in the homeless um, population I work with, most of them have phones. More than 80% of them have phones. Um, so related to that, I wanted to understand how to better um, reach underserved populations. So I actually moved into the community. And along with learning about the cell phone penetration issue, I also learned that there are things we're not talking about that are driving these health outcomes. The first one is health literacy. We've talked about that already. Um, distrust. We don't like to talk about distrust. And, I, and I'll, I'll end with a story that ties this all up for you. And the third one is trauma. Not just, you know, gunfire and robberies, but just the trauma associated with being poor and living in scarcity. Or having people treat you with indignity. Those are traumatic events that happen even when people enter the healthcare system. So I, I want you to think about this story as you go back to your work whether it's trying to include the voices of people or whether it's trying to understand where someone's coming from or thinking about the, our biases that we bring um, in the work that we do. My neighbor, um, chronic health conditions, I hadn't seen him in a long time and I saw him on the street. I said, where have you been? He said, oh, I was in the hospital. Uh, they told me um, something was wrong with my heart, but I don't believe that because I feel fine. Like, look at me, and you know, he's jumping around so that I can see there's nothing wrong with his heart. And I said, well, why did you go to the hospital in the first place? And he said, because I couldn't breathe. And I explained to him, we're standing down the street, and I explained to him why his heart is linked to his breathing. So the first issue is low health literacy. Why was that not explained to him? How did he leave the hospital and not understand the connection between the two? So he stopped taking his medications because he didn't understand the connection. Second, 
He didn't want to listen to what they had to say because he's been so disrespected in the past every time he goes to the hospital. He couldn't wait to leave. In fact, he left before he was supposed to. So that's the distrust and the trauma. And I think as we think about how we do our work, it's easy for us to be um, ritualistic about the way, the way we work because there's so much work to do. But I think if we think about the people we're trying to help and the challenges they have, because those are the social determinants. We're not talking about trauma, trust, distrust, and health literacy. So I, I hope that you all will do at least one thing different when you leave here, but at the very least, invite people from the community into conversations, because if we don't invite them, nobody's going to invite them. Unfortunately, the slides went a little too fast, so we do apologize for that. Um, networking break is going to go until about 3.30. And for anyone that doesn't know, my name is Amber Susi. I am a registered nurse at Boston Medical Center, so I understand all of that. Um, I am also a Wheezy Nurse on Twitter. I don't know if you know me or not. And I'm on the board of directors and I'm the social media lead for the Society for Participatory Medicine. So after this, the conversations can continue. So please interact with one another on social media. Keep this going. Great.